When the weather got rough, the crew of the Carly Bradley had grown accustomed to an unsettling sound rattling deep within their ship. As she hogged and sagged, lifting and falling with the waves, her steel hull would groan mightily, interrupted by an occasional sharp clanging sound. One by one, her twisting and bending was causing her rivets to fail. Her crew joked that the 30-year-old ship was held together with nothing but rust as they scooped the shattered rivets into a bucket and carried on with their work. The ominous warnings warranted little alarm and the Bradley, once the queen of the lakes, sailed on, growing more vulnerable storm after storm, wave after wave. The Great Lakes are a world of their own, and nowhere is this more evident than in the evocative unofficial title given to the largest ship sailing those great freshwater inland seas, Queen of the Lakes. The Carl D. Bradley held this distinction for 22 years. Founded in 1912, the Bradley Transportation Company, a subsidiary of the massive United States Steel Corporation, was created to manage a fleet of limestone carriers on the lakes. Limestone is an important ingredient in steelmaking, used to remove impurities during the blast process. The Michigan Limestone and Chemical Company, another subsidiary of U.S. Steel, operated the largest limestone quarry in the world near Rogers City, Michigan and the Bradley Transportation Company would play a vital role in carrying these materials to steel plants in Ohio. This lucrative business gave rise to a large fleet of self-unloading lake freighters. In 1923, the keel was laid down on hole number 797 at the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorraine, Ohio. Plans called for a massive flagship that would represent the power and prestige of the Bradley Transportation Company. At a length of 639 feet or 195 meters, and a beam of 65 feet or 20 meters, she would easily surpass the previous Queen of the Lakes. She would hold the title from when she was launched on April 9, 1927, until she was finally surpassed on June 28, 1949, the second longest reigning queen in the history of the Great Lakes. Emma Bradley, who was the wife of Carl D. Bradley, the head of the company, obviously, gave her her name. Since it was prohibition, instead of champagne, a bottle of calcite water from the company quarry was used to christen the vessel. She was the second ship to be named after the company's chief executive. The first Carl D. Bradley, launched in 1917, was renamed the SS Irvin L. Clymer and remained in service until 1990. The new Carl D. Bradley was powered by two Foster Wheeler high-pressure water tube boilers running a turboelectric drive that generated up to 4,800 shaft horsepower, making her one of the most powerful freighters on the lakes of the time, easily doubling the horsepower of most of her contemporaries. She entered service on July 28, 1927, and was based out of Roger City, Michigan. Her early career proved a great success as she carried limestone from Lake Huron to various ports on Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, and occasionally Lake Superior. In 1929, she set a record for the largest limestone cargo ever carried on the lakes at 18,144 tons. Because of her size and power, she was often the first ship to pass through the Straits of Mackinac at the start of the season, serving as an icebreaker and opening up passage for the smaller ships that followed. The flagship offered better accommodations than most ships on the lakes, and she frequently carried company executives. She was a cell phone loader, which meant that she was equipped with a large crane, making her capable of delivering cargo to smaller ports without shore unloading equipment. For the better part of three decades, the Carl B. Bradley was one of the most recognizable and celebrated freighters on the lakes. But on June 28, 1949, a new Queen of the Lakes was launched, 
the 678 foot Wilfred Sykes, which comfortably exceeded the length of the Bradley. While her prestige dimmed with age, the Carl D. Bradley sailed on, still a vital part of the U.S. steel supply chain, and by the late 1950s, there was no reason to believe her career would end anytime soon. On April 14, 1958, the Bradley Transportation Company celebrated a significant milestone. For 1,000 days across its entire fleet, there was not a single injury that resulted in a loss of man hours. And since the company's founding in 1912, they had never lost a single ship. Many considered the Carl D. Bradley one of the finest ships sailing the Great Lakes, even as she was eclipsed by newer and more modern vessels. Being the company's flagship, she was held to a higher standard, always sporting a fresh coat of paint to keep her looking her best. But this masked a rapidly aging freighter pushed to her limits time and time again. She was one of the busiest freighters in the Bradley fleet, and she enjoyed a solid and largely uneventful career but that soon began to change. On April 3rd, 1956, she collided with the MV Rose on the St. Clair River. While at first this wasn't considered a major incident, she did require repairs when she was dry docked in Chicago in May 1957. During this work, several hairline fractures, some up to six feet long, were discovered in her underbody amidship. These fractured sections were cropped out and replaced. While there was no formal inspection after the repairs were made, the patches were deemed satisfactory by the Coast Guard while the work was in progress. On February 26, 1958, the Carl D. Bradley was issued a new certificate of endorsement after she was inspected by Lloyd's Register of Shipping. And on April 17, 1958, she passed an annual inspection by the United States Coast Guard, which also deemed her seaworthy. But after her dry docking in May 1957, the Carl B. Bradley touched bottom on at least two occasions. The first of which occurred in the spring of 1958 while leaving Cedarville, Michigan. The grounding caused damage to her number one water bottom on her port side, just after her forward collision bulkhead. The damage was considered so minor that the company deemed no repairs were necessary. Then, in early 1958, she once again struck bottom while turning at Cedarville, damaging her number 7 water bottom again on the port side. The collision caused an approximately 14-inch traverse fracture. The damage was repaired while she was still afloat by the company's maintenance team in Calcite, Michigan. Neither of these incidents, nor the repairs made in Calcite, were ever reported to the Coast Guard or Lloyd's Register. The Carl D. Bradley underwent one final Coast Guard safety inspection on October 30th, 1958. During this inspection, the crew carried out a fire drill and a boat drill. Her crew lowered her number two lifeboat and demonstrated rowing, all to the inspector's satisfaction. Her captain also noted that the repairs made during her previous dry docking seemed to be holding up well, and she easily passed the inspection. But plans for an extensive overhaul of her cargo holds, bulkheads, and tank tops totaling approximately $800,000 worth of work was scheduled for the end of the season, suggesting her owners might have been aware that the aging vessel was in dire need of significant work. Her crew certainly knew. It was a common joke that the Bradley was held together with nothing but rust. And whenever the freighter encountered rough weather, they got used to the horrible sounds of rivets popping her whole bent and twisted with the waves. But these warning signs received little attention as they scooped the scattered ligaments of their ship into buckets and carried on with their work. 
James Silka graduated from Roger City High School in 1958. He was a popular student who played basketball and tennis. Like so many recent graduates, at 18 years old, Jimmy found himself at a crossroads. He wanted to go to college, but his family didn't have the money. So like his father, uncle, and cousins, Jimmy decided to get a job on the lakes. He figured he would work for a year or two to save up some money, and then he would decide where the next chapter of his life would take him. He signed up to sail on the T.W. Robinson, part of the respected Bradley transportation fleet, but he was soon invited to join the crew of the Carl D. Bradley to replace a porter that had recently left the ship. Jimmy's father was thrilled. He had experience sailing with Captain Roland Bryan, the commander of the Bradley since 1954, and he had immense respect for the man. He felt that his son was in good hands. Before he left, Jimmy's girlfriend Geraldine gave him a suitcase as a graduation gift. It was the first piece of luggage he had ever owned, having never ventured far from his home in Rogers City. Forty-eight-year-old Captain Roland Bryan was known as a heavy-weather captain. He took pride in delivering his cargo on time no matter the conditions, and this made him a very well-regarded captain in the Bradley fleet, where like most companies sailing the lakes at the time, speed and timely voyages were the top priority. But Captain Bryan privately doubted the capabilities of his ship. In a letter to a close friend, he shared concern that his ship wouldn't be able to handle rough weather and he was relieved that she would soon receive much-needed repair work on her aging hull. To his great relief, the Carl D. Bradley completed her final planned cargo-carrying voyage of the 1958 season on November 17th when she delivered a cargo of crushed limestone to Gary, Indiana. All that was left was a quick and easy voyage north to Manitowoc for her winter layup. She departed Gary at 10 p.m. without any cargo, and took on 9,000 gallons of water in her ballast tanks for stability. The weather forecast was grim. Winds were already topping 35 miles per hour when she left port, and a rough November gale was expected as two storm systems were about to merge over the Great Lakes. But the Bradley managed just fine as she hugged the coast of Wisconsin on her journey north. She was only an hour or so outside of Manitowoc when Captain Bryan received a call that filled him with dread. Despite the worsening weather conditions, U.S. Steel ordered the Carl D. Bradley sail to Calcite, Michigan, where she would pick up a last-minute load of stone. The 1958 season had been a slow one, and much of the Bradley fleet sat idle for months. Her owners were no doubt keen to seize the opportunity to improve the numbers of a disappointing year. Captain Bryan began the challenging maneuver that would thrust his ship into the worst of the growing storm but he took solace in the familiarity of the gale. While tough, these conditions were far from the worst that the captain and his ship had faced. He ordered the galley to prepare an earlier dinner to give his crew time to eat and prepare the ship. He knew that as they left the relative protection of the Wisconsin shoreline and headed east toward Lake Huron, they would be vulnerable to the worst of the storm as they raced across Lake Michigan. Despite the heavy weather, the mood on board was routine. This was just another crossing and the storm prompted little concern. The majority of the crew lived in Roger City, Michigan, right near Calcite, and they were just excited to be going home. Frank Mays was 26 years old when he joined the crew of the Carl D. Bradley in October 1958 as an able-bodied deck watchman. Frank found his first job on the lakes in June 1950, just after he graduated from high school. While in school, he couldn't wait to get a job on the boats, but after just a few months of working on the Adam E. Cornelius, he grew disillusioned. He briefly took a manufacturing job in Detroit before joining the Navy. After his four years of service, Frank married and took on another shore-based job. But when he learned that the Bradley Transportation Company was hiring, 
he moved his family back to Roger City, Michigan, and took a job with the company. Frank didn't mind working on the lakes, but it was a job that he was never fully passionate about. Still, it was decent work, and it provided a stable living for his wife and three young sons. He figured he would finish out the season, and then he would take some time to decide if he wanted to continue sailing. Just after dinner on the evening of November 18th, 1958, first mate Elmer Fleming asked Frank to go below and make sure the coal bunkers were secured and watertight. The wind was already howling at 65 miles per hour, and waves occasionally broke over the deck, but the Carl D. Bradley was riding smoothly, and to Frank, this was just another day at work. After securing the coal bunkers, he retreated below. He briefly ducked into the engine room and chatted with second assistant engineer Al Bomer and stoker Paul Heller. Many of the crew were Frank's neighbors back in Rogers City, and he was friends with pretty much everyone. He soon resumed his rounds and spent some time sumping water out of the aft end of the tunnel that ran the length of the ship. Severe rust in her ballast tanks and missing rivets meant that water was almost always leaking somewhere in the Bradley. But this was typical, and after a few minutes of work, Frank continued his rounds. He next went to secure the dunnage room at the forward end of the ship where paint and other deck equipment were stored. There he ran into another deckhand, Gary Price, his roommate and best friend on the ship. After securing the room, the two men sat down for a quick break. Their watch was ending at 8, and they knew they'd probably both be asleep when the ship arrived in Calcite. They speculated whether they would beat the Cedarville. Arriving first meant that they could go home sooner, and they hoped that Captain Bryant could pull it off. Their conversation was interrupted by a loud thud somewhere deep in the ship, followed by an intense vibration. The men knew what a ship sounded like in rough weather, but this was unlike anything they had ever heard. Within moments, the ship's alarm bell sounded. They immediately raced topside, stopping in their cabin to grab their life jackets. By the time they made it out on deck, it was clear that they were in serious danger. Frank looked out at the ship's stern, but to his horror, he saw the entire aft section of the ship rising and falling with the waves, ripping away from the bow somewhere near the 10th hatch. On the bridge, Captain Brian, First Mate Fleming, and wheelsman Ray Kowalski were on duty, navigating through the storm when they heard the awful thud somewhere behind them. The captain and First Mate raced out on deck on the port side and looked back in horror. It was normal for large ships to bend and twist in such conditions, but this was like nothing they had ever seen. Her stern flapped up and down, and the row of lights that lined her deck, usually creating a perfectly straight line, ended abruptly somewhere amidship after her conveyor boom. Their ship had ripped in two. It was a moment every sailor dreads, the realization that their ship had failed them. The Bradley's pilot house almost immediately began listing to port as her bow flooded. Captain Brian and first mate Fleming took quick action. Brian immediately ordered the engine stopped and sounded the ship's alarm while Fleming jumped on the ship's radio and began sending out a critical distress call. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is the Carl D. Bradley. Our position is approximately 12 miles southwest of Goal Island. We are breaking in two and sinking. Any ships in the vicinity, please come to our aid. No one responds. Fleming has no life jacket. He looks out and sees the ship's deck crew rushing topside behind the pilot house. Frank Mays is desperately working to untie the tiny life raft. The ship's two lifeboats are located in the stern. With the ship's two halves now grinding and smashing into each other, there was almost no hope that the officers and deck crew could reach the galley and engine crew housed in the stern. Their only hope is the ship's radio. Fleming repeats his desperate mayday call again and again, praying for a voice in the deafening chaos. 
at the WAD Marine Radio Station in Port Washington, Wisconsin, Ray Burnett listened to the idle chatter that echoed over Channel 51. Burnett's radio station stayed connected to the frequency 24 hours a day. While it was used for communication on the Atlantic and Pacific, as well as on the Mississippi and Ohio River, on the Great Lakes, the channel was reserved for distress calls. Most of the time, Brunette and his fellow radio operators heard nothing but the dull chit-chat between riverboat captains. But that evening, as a storm raged over Lake Michigan, the idle drone was cut by a desperate voice shouting Mayday. Brunette grabbed his microphone and shouted for other operators to clear the channel. He then asked the voice for a position. The radio crackled. Then the voice responded, 12 miles southwest of Goal Island. He scanned his map for nearby life-saving stations that could offer assistance. There was no one close. In the background roar of the radio, he hears another voice shouting orders. Run, get the life jackets. We're breaking in half, get the life jackets. We're sinking. Brunette began calling other ships in the area. He then contacted nearby Coast Guard stations. At this point, the best hope of saving the men on the Bradley was extending the distress call as wide as possible. On the other side of the lake, at the Coast Guard station in Charlevoix in western Michigan, Chief Boatswain Joe Etienne was on duty when he picked up the Bradley's distress call. The frantic mayday gave their position and then suddenly cut out. Etienne tried to contact Elmer Fleming for more details, but he heard nothing. The two spoke only a few moments prior, and all seemed well. But Etienne knew that conditions on the lakes could change in an instant. His calls to the Bradley were met with silence. Elmer Fleming's distress calls were heard on radios all over the lakes. On Lake Huron, another ship in the Bradley Transportation Fleet, the John G. Munson, was struggling through the storm to reach Rogers City. The Munson replaced the Bradley as the longest ship in the fleet when she was launched in August 1952. She was only about half an hour outside Calcite when the Mayday call crackled over her radio. Both second assistant engineer Charlie Horn and oiler George Meredith had brothers on the Bradley. Charlie's brother Paul loved working in the Bradley's engine rooms and hoped to soon follow in his brother's footsteps and earn his third assistant engineer's license during the winter layup. When he heard about the distress call, George remembered with horror a conversation he had had with his brother Dennis only one week before, when Dennis, four years older than him, took him out for drinks to celebrate his 21st birthday. While younger, George actually had more experience sailing than his older brother. When Dennis left the army, he considered going to business school, but George convinced him to get a job with the Bradley Transportation Company to earn some money first. Now. All he could do was think about a question his brother had asked him over drinks. Do you think the Bradley is seaworthy? Do you think it'll break in half? Taken aback by his brother's question, George asked him what he meant. Dennis described the twisting and groaning of the hull in rough weather, the leaks in the rust, and the popping rivets. But George shrugged off his brother's concern. How would a big boat like that sink, he asked and the conversation quickly moved to something else. A similar anxiety played out on the Cedarville and the T.W. Robinson, both having crew with relatives on the Bradley. In the tight-knit community of sailing families, it was almost inevitable. Now all they could do was wait and hope. For most of the day, Captain Paul Mueller of the 256-foot German freighter Christian Sartori was fighting through one of the worst storms he had ever experienced in his six years sailing on the lakes. As they passed through the Straits of Mackinac and moved along the northern coast of Upper Michigan, things only got worse. The steamer was designed to handle the North Atlantic, but she was only able to make two to three miles per hour as she was lashed by the wind and waves. Then, somewhere in the maelstrom, Captain Mueller spotted the lights of a large limestone carrier 
He calculated that they would pass the freighter in about an hour, and he ordered a slight course adjustment to provide plenty of room for a safe port-to-port -port passage. But only a moment later, his second mate, Jurgen Swan, called out, The lights are going out on the forward part of the ship. Mueller grabbed his binoculars, and to his horror, he saw the giant freighter go completely dark from her bow to just before her aft superstructure. Then the lights in her stern flickered out as well. Mueller's heart sank for his fellow mariners. A power failure in a storm like this could be catastrophic. Suddenly, the barely visible silhouette of the stricken ship erupted in a giant red and yellow ball of fire, followed soon by the sound of a massive explosion that broke through the roaring storm. Then the flames seemed to slip below the waves. Captain Mueller checked his radar, but the ship was gone. He immediately directed his ship to sail for the scene of the explosion, knowing that despite their proximity, it would be at least an hour before they could reach any survivors. The Carl D. Bradley began splitting in two at around 5.31 p.m. Her hull sank beneath the waves of Lake Michigan only a few minutes later. With so little time to react, her crew of 35 had almost no chance of survival. From the moment Captain Roland Bryan realized that his ship was breaking up, he did everything he could to save his crew. He ordered the engine stopped and then sounded seven short blasts followed by one long blast from the ship's horn, the signal to abandon ship. Over the radio, his voice was heard by multiple operators shouting at various crew members to run and put on their life jackets. As the ship ripped apart, the buoyancy of her bow and stern section changed. Her stern, with the heavy engines and boilers low in the hull, maintained its center of gravity and for a time it remained on an even keel. But the bow, with its heavy boom on deck, immediately became top-heavy without the stern or cargo to anchor it, and it immediately began to capsize. Around half a dozen men gathered on the pilot house deck as it began toppling into the waves. Frank Mays worked desperately to untie the single tiny life raft. Soon, the ship's electric cable snapped, plunging the bow into darkness and cutting Elmer Fleming's desperate mayday calls short as the radio died. In the chaos, the lights of the stern seemed to offer some kind of refuge. Second mate, John Fogelsanger, made a dash for the stern. He tried to jump between the two halves as they heaved in the waves, but he missed, dropping into the darkness of the gap. When the radio went silent, Elmer Fleming's attention turned to saving his own life. He realized that there were no more life jackets nearby. Another crew member handed him a life ring, but this wouldn't be enough to save him. He knew that he would have little chance of surviving in the water regardless, but without a life jacket, he would have almost none. In a daring gamble, he raced below to retrieve the life jacket stored in his cabin, running down two decks in total darkness as the ship rolled around him. Up on deck, as the bow increasingly listed to port, Captain Brian shouted to his men to climb to the highest point to keep them out of the water as long as possible. But the moment the men began scaling the ship's railing, a massive wave swept over them and the bow rolled violently, sending almost everyone flying into the water. As the bow plunged down, Frank clung to the life raft. He couldn't get it free in time, so now his only hope was that it would automatically break free as it was designed to when it plunged into the waves. But as his body slammed into the frigid water, the shock of the cold and the impact ripped him away from the life raft. He was dragged deep below, but after what felt like an eternity, he finally resurfaced. He heard the sounds of other men screaming in the torrent of the storm, and the awful sounds of the mighty ship meeting its end. The bow was gone, but Frank could clearly see straight into the cargo holds in the stern as it filled with water. The break was so clean, it looked like a giant cleaver had sliced through the ship. His life jacket helped keep his head above the water, but it took considerable effort to keep it on as each wave crashed over him, forcing his body down while the cork jacket shot up. 
In a stroke of luck, he soon came across the meager life raft, and with considerable effort, he lifted himself onto the tiny platform. The raft had no oars, and it was easily tossed around in the massive waves, but it kept him mostly out of the water, giving him precious time before hypothermia could set in. Incredibly, Elmer managed to find his life jacket in the darkness. He quickly raced back on deck just as the bow took its final plunge. But before he could do anything, the ship lurched over and he was thrown 20 feet in the air as he was flung into the water. When he resurfaced thanks to the buoyancy of his life jacket, he was only a couple of feet from the same life raft that Frank clung to. He climbed on and the two men began shouting for the other men in the water, hoping to guide them to the raft. Soon they saw Gary Sturzeletsky swimming toward them. Another deck watchman, Gary was one of the most physically fit men on the ship and he was widely considered to be the best swimmer. He climbed on the raft, but in a panic he insisted that he needed to go back in and find his brother-in-law, wheelsman Ray Kowalski. He said he couldn't imagine facing his sister if he survived and her husband did not. But after considerable convincing by Elmer, the only officer on the raft, he reluctantly agreed to stay put. Not long after, they came across deckhand Dennis Meredith, and with great struggle they lifted him on the raft. Unlike the other three men, Dennis was asleep in his cabin when the ship began breaking up and he didn't have time to put on warmer clothes as he raced topside. He wore just a light sweater and pants. His feet were bare. He was already in a state of shock and shivering violently as he was lifted onto the raft. The other men huddled around him to try and warm him up. They heard other voices crying out for help and for a moment they spotted wheelsman Mel Orr, but he was almost immediately swept away. The Bradley stern still towered over them, its forward end slowly pulling the remains of the ship nearly vertical. It paused for a moment and then began its final plunge. As the boilers reached the cold water, a massive explosion rocked the crippled ship as it dropped below in a haze of fire and steam. The four men on the raft were alone on Lake Michigan as the storm raged around them. Fleming knew that there was another ship nearby close enough to witness the death of their ship. He told the others that while it might be a while, help was certainly on the way, lifting their spirits considerably. He pulled a flare from the raft's small supply box and lit it, hoping that the bright red sparks would guide their rescuers to them. Their modest pontoon-style raft consisted of only two 8x10 foot wooden platforms attached on either side to large red barrels. While the craft was rated to hold up to 15, it was hard to imagine that it could support anyone else. It was a constant challenge trying to keep the raft from flipping over in the massive swells. It was equipped with a small supply chest that contained three flares and a sea anchor, which the men quickly deployed. Fortunately, it seemed to do its job, keeping the craft from flipping over with every wave. Fleming soon lit a second flare. Gary Strzelecki did what he could to help lift the men's spirits. He called out warnings whenever he spotted a particularly large wave heading toward them, and helped rally the men to hold out just a little bit longer. Gary was widely admired, both for his instincts and his unique personality. He loved to draw, and he loved comic books. He spent much of his free time making art, a quality that stood out amongst his peers. Him and his wife Anne had a three-month-old son back home at Rogers City, and Gary was determined to make it back to them. After about an hour, they saw the lights of a ship drawing toward them. The ship was rolling up to 50 degrees in the heavy surf, and the sailors on the raft couldn't help but be impressed by the seamanship on display before them. When it was only around 100 yards away, Fleming grabbed the last remaining flare to help guide their rescuers to the raft. But when he pulled off the cap and attempted to spark it, nothing happened. He desperately tried again and again, but the flare was too waterlogged to ignite. On the Sartori, Captain Mueller had his men line the railing, searching for any traces of the ill-fated vessel or her crew. About an hour before, he saw flashes of red appear in the distance and then fade away. Surely these must have been survivors. But when they reached the scene, they found nothing but a single tank floating in the water. 
After sweeping the area, Captain Mueller called Ray Burnett at the radio station in Port Washington and reported that they found no survivors. He suspected that the ship went down with all hands. The ship's searchlights swept by the men on the raft, leaving them in darkness as they fell into yet another trough, hiding them from view as their rescue ship passed by them. They watched helplessly as the Christian Sartori, their only hope of saving, sailed by, leaving them alone in the vastness of Lake Michigan. When the Bradley went down, a similar scene of chaos ensued on her stern. As the ship broke apart, Hardy Felix, Al Bomer, and Pete Horn desperately tried to launch one of the two 25-person lifeboats, but it was hopelessly tangled in the falls. They tried to cut the steel cables with an axe, but no matter how hard they tried, it wouldn't break free. The lifeboat on the other side of the ship was rendered useless by the angle of sinking. Those who managed to get out of the engine room in time raced on deck only to find nowhere to go as the lights flickered out and the stern lifted high into the air, the bow already vanishing beneath the waves. Their final moments are a mystery. With no lifeboats, the men had nothing but the emergency life raft attached to her bow, a craft that couldn't support more than a few of them, if they were even able to find it. As the stern began its final plunge, an explosion of fire and steam ripped out of her funnel as her hot boilers plunged into the cold water. Most of the men in the stern were likely killed in the sinking, and those that survived were stranded helpless in the churning water. After the Sartori steamed away, hope on the small raft dimmed. One particularly large wave crushed into them and overturned the craft, sending all four men plunging back into the water. Gary, Elmer, and Frank all managed to pull themselves back on the raft, but Dennis Meredith, already barely conscious, was only able to cling to the side. The men were too weak to pull him up. And a few hours later, Elmer realized that Dennis's face was in the water. He pulled his head up, only to realize that the man was dead. He lifted his arms from the raft and let him float away. His body was never found. Soon the effects of hypothermia began setting in for the other three men. Gary Strzelecki was the first to begin slipping in and out of consciousness. Frank and Elmer did their best to keep him alert. But just before daybreak, Gary began mumbling about swimming to shore, convinced he could make it. The other two tried to stop him, but he pushed his way off the raft and began swimming away. Now, it was just Frank Mays and Elmer Fleming alone on the raft as the first lights of dawn broke over the horizon. The moment the Bradley's Mayday calls echoed over the radio, life-saving stations in the area began organizing search and rescue efforts. The storm and area of sinking made these operations difficult. The life-saving station at Plum Island deployed a 36-foot boat, but the crew was unable to make any headway in the storm and they were soon forced to shelter near Washington Island. At the Coast Guard station in Charlevoix, the 180-foot cutter Sundew was by far the best equipped vessel in the area to mount a search but much of her crew was on shore leave at the time. Through an incredible effort by Captain Harold Muff, she was ready to sail within an hour of receiving the distress call, and she arrived on the scene at 10.40 p.m. to join the Sartori in the search for survivors. The Coast Guard Cutter Hollyhock from Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin joined them on the scene at 1.30 a.m. The conditions were brutal, with the storm still raging over the area. All the while, relatives of the Bradley's crew rushed to the Coast Guard station in Charlevoix, knowing that the survivors would be brought there first. But hope of locating any of the Bradley's crew dimmed as the night turned to morning and the sun crested over the horizon. Captain Muth knew all too well that it was unlikely anyone 
even in a proper lifeboat, could survive the night in these conditions. Standing near him on the bridge was watchman Richard Sellison, scanning the horizon through binoculars when he suddenly called for the captain's attention. He wasn't sure what it was, but he saw something bobbing in the water. Captain Muff took the binoculars, and soon a small raft with two men on it came into view. Captain Muff and his crew began the delicate operation of transferring the two men onto the ship. The Sundew was brought alongside the raft to offer protection from the waves. Crew then climbed down cargo nets, and two of them gently stepped onto the raft and secured lines to their ship before gently lifting the two barely conscious men onto the deck of the Sundew. Incredibly, both men were soon brought back to full consciousness. They insisted that the Sundew remain in the area and continue searching for survivors rather than sailing back to shore for full medical care. The search went on as more and more ships joined the operation. Just after 1 p.m., another vessel, the Trans Ontario, spotted a man in the water floating on its back. It was Gary Strzelecki, still alive after spending hours in the water. He was brought on board, but the man was nearly dead. Arrangements were made to airlift him by helicopter to a hospital, but just as the helicopter arrived to take him aboard, the mission was aborted. Gary Strzelecki died on the Trans Ontario. The search continued, but now the Sundew and other ships only found bodies. Not long after picking up Frank and Elmer, a helicopter spotted an overturned lifeboat. The Sundew raced to investigate, but when they found the boat, it appeared unused. It likely broke free from the ship during the sinking, but it seemed that no one found it. In total, 18 bodies were recovered. 15 were never found. In addition to the bodies picked up, rescuers found a number of life jackets that were fastened but empty, suggesting that the men wearing them slipped out of them sometime in the night. Everything that night was against them. Rogers City, Michigan was hit hard by the sinking of the Carl D. Bradley. A majority of the crew lived in the tiny community, and nearly everyone lost either a friend or a relative in the tragedy. 23 women were widowed, and 53 children lost their fathers. Two unborn babies would never know their dad. Frank Mays and Elmer Fleming managed to make full recoveries and share their stories. But there were still many unanswered questions and an investigation was quickly launched by the Coast Guard Marine Board. Their findings concluded that the Bradley sank from excessive hogging stresses and concluded that Captain Bryant exercised poor judgment when he decided to leave the protected coast of Wisconsin and sail for the open lake during the storm. They issued a series of recommendations, including changes to make it easier to launch lifeboats in an emergency, additional life rafts, additional flares that could be fired in the air, and life jackets that included crotch straps and collars to support the neck. But both Elmer Fleming and Frank Mays were adamant that the Bradley split in two. Their claims were widely accepted, and the Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, Vice Admiral A.C. Richmond, issued his own report contradicting the Marine Board's findings. He concluded that Captain Bryan did not exercise poor judgment, and based on reports that the ship was riding fine in the storm, he did not take any extraordinary risk. Instead, the Bradley sank after breaking up due to an undetected structural weakness or defect. The controversy over what exactly happened raged on. If the Bradley sank in the storm due to poor seamanship, the accident could be considered an act of God, relieving U.S. Steel from any liability. But if she did indeed break up, they could be at fault for operating an unsafe ship. Less than one year after the disaster in 1959, the United States Army Corps of Engineers located the wreck using sonar, laying five miles northwest of Boulder Reef, just south of Goal Island. U.S. Steel quickly commissioned a survey of the wreck using underwater cameras, 
The murky footage produced by the expedition appeared to show the Bradley resting on the lake bed intact, supporting their claim that the tragedy was indeed an act of God. But it's worth noting that this survey was conducted in secrecy without any impartial witnesses overseeing the work. A settlement was reached one year and 16 days after the accident in which U.S. Steel gave $1.25 million that would be divided amongst the victims' families. The settlement was incredibly fast and it did not provide lifelong support. The tragedy left many families in a dire financial situation, having lost their only source of income. Frank Mays was adamant about what he witnessed that night. In 1995, he joined an expedition that sought to dive the wreck once again and finally proved that the Bradley broke up. The poor visibility made it impossible to verify. During the dive, Frank was able to place a plaque on the wreck to honor his fellow crewmen. They would try once again. In 1997, the same team sent an ROV to examine the wreck. Finally, they were able to observe the break in her hull exactly where Frank and Elmer described it. Frank later wrote, I saw it go down in two pieces on the surface, and now I've seen it in two pieces on the bottom of Lake Michigan. Frank Mays lived long enough to share his story with the world. He wrote a book about that night and spoke frequently about the disaster. He passed away in 2021. To me, the story of the Carl D. Bradley is the story of the men who worked on her. For some, it was another chapter in a long career on the lakes. But for others, it was just a job to tide them over before they moved on with their lives. Young men like James Silka, an 18-year-old discovering the world for the first time. His body was never found. When the Carl D. Bradley broke up on Lake Michigan in 1958, the lives of these men were considered expendable. It wouldn't be until the loss of the Edmund Fitzgerald nearly two decades later that a culture of safety would finally become normal on the lakes. But for well over 100 years, countless lives were lost for no reason, leaving thousands of holes in the tight-knit communities that sent their sons out on the lakes, praying that they would return. I just want to take a quick second to thank everyone for watching, especially those of you who have made it to the end. 2023 was my first year creating videos like this full time and I feel so incredibly lucky. It's because of your support, whether it be liking, commenting, joining my Patreon, or just watching, that I'm able to share stories like this one. Thank you. I can't wait for what I have in store for 2024. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.